Great. All righty. Um, welcome, everybody, to session two of the QGIS Open Day. Um, I would like to welcome our friends from Lutra and from um, North Road and Hobu, et cetera, et cetera, um, who are going to be showing us a list of brand new features that are being added, um, well, to QGIS 3.24, but also sneak preview to QGIS um, 3.26. Um, and we're going to look at some 3D map view improvements. We're looking at cloud optimization, um, elevation profiles, and some really cool, exciting stuff. So I'd like to hand over to you, Martin, to tell us more about this and show us some awesome things. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. So yeah, um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so where do we start? Um, I guess um, the the start of all this uh, was with um, a crowdfunding campaign uh, that we uh, run last year during autumn winter time. Um, so uh, we we were fortunately successful again. Uh, let me share my screen as well. Um, and um, so uh, we did a crowdfunding campaign uh, where we promised um, a bunch of features. Um, and the good news is that uh, most of what we have um, uh, suggested to, to do is um, already either done or uh, will be done uh, very soon. So we would like to use this opportunity to like show uh, what has been done already. Plus, um, another good news is that there will be also few bits uh, that were not even uh, listed here, but um, were uh, funded uh, separately and are also uh, related to point clouds or generally um, 3D uh, stuff in QGIS. Um, also, let me just quickly say big thanks to everyone who has um, um, co-funded this uh, effort. So here's my um, here's one of the blog posts we have done on the on the progress with uh, the implementation. So um, yeah, it's been a lot of um, uh, companies, public administrations, um, individuals. So it's been great effort. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, this is just the list of those who were willing to be listed. There were also uh, some anonymous donors. Um, all this work has been done yeah, by the three companies. So us at the Lutra Consulting, um, at, uh, Hobu and uh, uh, Northroad. And um, I guess uh, it's a good time to diving into uh, the uh, features. Uh, just checking, do we have uh, Stefanos here? Uh, not yet, apparently he may be having some technical issues. Uh, so um, for the time being, um, uh, let me think, Belgasen, would you like to uh, start with, um, actually, uh, sorry, um, uh, before before that, uh, we have some new people. No, st still no sign of uh, Stefanos. Um, maybe Howard, can you do a bit of intro of um, one of the um, things um, that we have worked uh, together, the Copsy and so on? Sure. Um, I don't... Before I Howard jumps in, which I'm excited to hear about, I just want to make the point to all the viewers who are watching that this is the type of thing crowdfunding this is open source if you need some kind of functionality um if you were previously here for the um whale talk if you need some kind of functionality or think something cool should be included in the QGIS project this is how you go about it you crowdfund you create interest you bring in the experts and you can basically build whatever you need so I think that is an absolutely amazing thing that has happened, and this is how it comes about. So again, thank you to all those people who crowdfunded it, and to all the guys in the room here who had the ideas. So that was just side note to everyone watching, and back over to you. Uh, 
All right, I'll uh, I'll go forward then. Uh, I don't have any prepared slides, but uh, I was going to talk a little bit about kind of the data management and data story of point clouds in the open source ecosystem. Uh, so there's a really important uh, person in our community who died this past year named Martin Eisenberg, who developed the the LazZip uh, software, which um, provide or can, provided a format called LAZ, which is uh, seen all over the place in um, LIDAR and point cloud data archives. And so it's kind of the, the format du jour of geospatial LIDAR, especially for transmitting uh, data and, and archiving it and delivering it to people. And um, we saw LAZ as having two significant deficiencies. The first was uh, it didn't support selecting uh, data for a resolution. And then the other one is it didn't uh, support selecting data for a spatial window or partially selecting data out of it. So LAZ uh, requires you to kind of read the entire file to be able to get uh, the information that you need from it. And um, But it did have features available to it to allow us to do the same thing that happened to uh, with GeoTIFF and the cloud-optimized GeoTIFF. And so COPSI or COPIC or however you would like to pronounce the, the acronym is Cloud Optimized Point Cloud. And, and what it's about is um, providing a bit of backward compatible metadata that allows applications, if they so choose, to be able to uh, seek and skip through the file and only de uh, fetch and decompress what they need uh, at the time that they need it. Uh, this can happen over HTTP if you were doing a streaming sort of scenario, just like Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF. Or if you're doing uh, files on a local file system, they can uh, skip and hop around the file on their local file system. The advantage of COPSI or COPIC uh, for applications is it's backward compatible with LAZ. So applications that have support for LAZ to read content um, can read COPSI files to get access to those points, even if they don't understand the special metadata that allows it to be streamed or, or incrementally fetched. Uh, this is kind of, in my opinion, the most important part about why cloud-optimized GeoTIFF has been su so successful, uh, especially in scenarios where uh, as people are moving their processing and, and data management uh, back up to servers in many cases where they want to be able to stream content uh, locally and do what they need to be able to do part with partial access to content, this is a, a really important feature. And so we're really excited that uh, uh, Copsy is available or Copic is available for people to, to do this with. Um, you can write or construct Copic files with uh, the Poodle library, PDAL library. Um, there's also an open source library called Untwine. Um, the difference between the two is one uses all of, uh, loads everything in memory to be able to process and sort and organize the files. And the other, Untwine, uh, uses a dist cache approach to do that. So um, you can have a choice as to how you want to do your data management. We hope other applications will pick up uh, COPSI support. Um, certainly on the read side, there's starting to be more of those. Uh, LASPI, which is you know a very common and widely used Python library for manipulating LAS uh, content, recently got a pull request to implement COPSI support. And, uh, and of course, QGIS. So, uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Stefanos or, or Martin, whoever wants to pick up the ball after this. So I can see that Stefanos has managed to join us. Um, Stefanos, if, uh, feel free to continue with uh, your part of the demo. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, just to make sure that I can be heard. I... Yes. Yeah, Perfect. all right. So let me start by sharing my screen. Uh, what I'm going to show you are a couple of features I worked on for this latest version. And the uh, first one is uh, filtering of point clouds on the provider level. So This is it. Okay, so this is a, a sample data set, uh, a 3D view here. And um, so 
until this version, uh, one could uh, filter uh, the point cloud uh, with the classified renderer uh, when using the classification attribute. So uh, if uh, one doesn't want to display the buildings or any class, you could just uh, uh, disable it here. But uh, this means that uh, he would uh, he was forced to use uh, those colors for the renderer. So what we implemented here is that you can actually right click and select filter. You get a window kind of like uh, how it is for the vector layers. And here you can type in some expression. Stephanus, sorry, I think yes. you are sharing just the main QGIS window, so we can't see your uh, dialog see open. This. All right. Mm. Let me let me let me try again. So this is the entire screen. Okay. So now you can see the query builder. Yeah, nice. Perfect. So using this, uh, you can actually select uh, some classes that you don't want to be displayed or to display. So like, uh, I don't want the buildings here. I can do this and the buildings disappear. And uh, uh, yeah, this is pretty much what would happen if I just uh, unclick buildings from here. But now what I can actually do is that I can go to the renderer and select a different renderer, like the RGB renderer, which this data set doesn't have. RGB values, but I can use the attribute by ramp and uh, have my uh, my points colorized by Z value, and uh, the buildings aren't there. So this is something that couldn't be done, or I could just select to show only the buildings with the Z values. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, the query builder allows us more uh, complex uh, expressions to be constructed also, so you can uh, do things like uh, filtering by z-value, so I can do something like this, and I only have uh, the upper part of this data set, or uh, I could also sandwich my data between uh, an upper and lower value. So for example, if I go this and Z greater than 235, I get a slice of my data here. And uh, I can also construct something bigger one, like for example, uh, put some limits on the X and Y so I can have only this part of the of the data set and so on. Um, one other handy uh, expression is that you can actually get the, um, uh, play with a number of returns. So I can have the return number that is not the last return uh, value. Return, uh, uh, yeah, return from the from the sensor. Um, and get something like this. Uh, now one can type arbitrarily arbitrary expressions here. So I could in theory construct uh, an, uh, the uh, um, the, the function for a line. So I could actually uh, use X and Y values for um, uh, to create something like um, a profile. But uh, the profile is another tool which is was built after this was uh, developed. So we're not going to do such things now. Um, so one other feature which uh, I realized that maybe we should showcase here is uh, 
uh, it's not my work, it's Belgasem's work, but uh, uh, navigating the 3D map is uh, significant, significantly better in this version because we can actually zoom to specific part of the um, of the 3D view and directly under our mouse cursor. So we can zoom to this spot or zoom to this spot and uh, rotate around specific parts of the of the 3D scene. So this uh, helps navigation a lot, in my opinion. Uh, now, next feature I worked on here was um, the actual drawing order uh, for the 2D views. And uh, what does this mean? Let me show with an example which will be more apparent. So uh, the point clouds, uh, the, the drawing order on a 2D view for the point clouds is kind of random and that's because of the way the last format, the EPT format we're using these. So um, in uh, this part of this building, there are points that are under the roof and points over the roof. So what gets displayed is kind of random, not exactly random, but not the way what, that uh, the user usually expects it to be. So we've added um, on the styling panel an option to change the draw order. So we can have a draw order from bottom to top, which means that the lower points get drawn first and uh, the upper points uh, are drawn last. So we can actually see uh, the roof here. And there's also the inverted one, so that you can actually see the floor here, which are points uh, just inside the building. Um, mm, all right, so uh, next feature is, um, I'll switch to my previous data set, there is some improvement in the classification renderer here. Uh, so in previous versions, uh, when we were choosing the classification renderer, we got uh, those uh, 18 classes, the default classes for the last files. Now, using the work from uh, uh, Belga using Belgasem's work about uh, the statistics calculation for uh, point clouds, we can actually now only have the classes that are that uh, are actually used uh, in this data set. So uh, we don't have the rest of these uh, unused classes cluttering the UI here. And uh, we also get to see the percentage of the, those points uh, in our scene. Um, and uh, the same goes for other attributes. So if we change to number of returns, uh, we should be getting, but we're not getting on this one. Uh, mm. Mm, something's wrong with this. <laughs> Live demos. <laughs> yeah. I think I have tried exactly this uh, yesterday and got the same issue. <laughs> mm, maybe this is some bug. Uh, let's let's check this after the demo. <laughs> uh, Okay, so the key here is that we are supposed to be able to uh, classify uh, and get classes based on any attribute that uh, have, uh, that is um, that exists on our dataset. Now, uh, next feature uh, 
is some usability improvement uh, when switching between 2D and 3D views. Uh, it's quite common that the user says, okay, I don't want, uh, I, I create the renderer for my 2D view and then when switching to the 3D view, uh, thinking, oh, I wanted to actually have those settings for the 3D view and not for the 2D view. So we've got here a new entry that says follow to this symbology in the 3D renderer settings. And uh, from now on, any changes that we do on the 2D view also follow for the 3D view. And that means that I can change the, the renderer to another one and this uh, keeps changing. Oh, that's super convenient, I love that. Uh, yeah, we're actually considering to have this in the future as the default setting. So for any layer that gets added, any point cloud layer, uh, we actually have to fiddle with one set of renderers. And if a user specifically needs to separate the 2D from the 3D, he will have the option to just select the one that he wants for the 3D. Awesome. Uh, all right, I think that's pretty much it from my part. I think those are fantastic features. Just as a side note, where was that? It looks like a good place to go and visit castles and everything. Mm, I'm not exactly sure. I've <laughs> borrowed this data set from Martin. I, it might be in Slovakia, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it's a castle in my hometown, uh, Trenčín. So if there is anyone interesting to visit, uh, you're most welcome. We all have a virtual visit with 3D QGIS. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, brilliant. Alrighty, onwards. Um, awesome, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Stefanos, for the demo. Uh, so I guess we can move on to... Um, the part from uh, Dolgasen that uh, he's been working on. So, Dolgasen, over to you. Yes, thank you, Martin. And thank you, Stefanos, for the, for the demo. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, it works. Perfect. Uh, I'm using the master version of QGIS. So some of these features are going to be, be in the next version, the 2.6. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to just like drag and drop one COPC data set, data set to show that it loads correctly and stuff. Basically here what happens is that uh, since the COPC data sets don't contain statistics, you will get some like task load in here to calculate the statistics so that afterward you can uh, QGIS uses that to do stuff like the classification. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to right. like the classifier and drop. Sorry, there is some echo. Don't worry, I'm muted. Okay, so uh, I was saying that the statistics are used to do the classification stuff. Like here, some uh, some data sets contain non-default values, like here, like these ones here. And it is much better that way. Like if you see here, some of them are uh, won't be displayed if if it wasn't for the statistics calculation. Now I'm going I'll to... Yeah. Do you mind just hiding the share bar? It's just distracting from sort of the bottom middle of the screen. Yes, sorry Take about hide. that. Thank you, thank you so yeah. much. No problem. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is to just load uh, a remote EPT data set. What I have here is... Uh, is that I made uh, a Python range HTTP server on my machine so that I don't have like problems with my connection and stuff. 
So what I'm going to do is to just copy the link and add it from here. You can add it from the data source manager, just like paste the link and add it. Oh, unfortunately, like there is kind of two now. <laughs> yeah, this one is the, uh, the local one. So I will just remove that layer. Basically, it just loads the same way as the local COPC ones, and like the statistics will be calculated the same way and everything. You can do like the same things uh, we have been already doing with uh, uh, with the LAZ attribute by ramp, like do the instance stuff and so on like do the color by ramp stuff and anything you want. Um, the, next, the next feature that I'm going to show, uh, show is the 3D views manager, this one here. Currently we don't have any, so I will create a new 3D view. I will just like, activate the iDoom lighting because it looks much better. Now we can have multiple ones, not just one 3D view. And both of them could be saved into, saved into the project. So I'm going to pick some place to put it. Like let's call it project, save it. And then when I close QGIS, and start it again. I will have the, uh, the same two 3D views. Here, the, both of them are loaded in the same location as before. In the data views manager, like you can even close them and save the project and then like open them again. And they will still be in the project. Like here. Here's the first one and the second one. There is also like a window to manage the 3D views like this. You can like duplicate or remove or rename it like here. Let's duplicate the second map to something like duplicate. Duplication. as the other one, sorry, no, like I mistakenly docked it with the other one. One other feature uh, that I implemented is the undocking. So you can have the 3D view as a window now, not just, uh, where is it? Sorry. <laughs> So basically, you could undock it, and it essentially it went somewhere. Yeah, here's the second uh, 3D map view. <laughs> Sorry, I, I clicked by mistake again. <laughs> this like this thing is advantageous because it's like not constrained to the Qt UI, and you can like move uh, resize it more easily and move it around easier. The, with the existing docking mechanism, it was like, if your screen's resolution is too big, like mine now, it it is very frustrating to resize the window. Yeah, and what is exciting that now you can even 
make the window full screen so you don't need to deal with these small windows anymore. Yes, like this. Also nice to put, be able to put them side by side or one on one screen, one on the other, that sort of thing. Yes. Very cool. Now I'm going to move into the next feature, which is uh, which is transparent objects. So I'm going to open another project that I have. So th this one is one of the little surprises that were not part of the original crowdfunding campaign, but um, yes. um, we love a surprise. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> it was added just recently so here is like a project with some like transparent buildings there as you can see um, you can configure it, configure like the transparency of the object uh, like here there is a slider in this uh, 3d renderer settings that you can change so for example, like we can make it very transparent and apply it. This looks way too transparent. <laughs> and also like by default, it's usually like 100% opacity. So it is not transparent at all. Could you apply this kind of transparency to say um, tree cover so you could kind of see the ground underneath the tree cover? I believe it depends if it's like the point symbols. Mm. The point symbols, I don't think you can yet. It okay. could be added in the future. But here it is for vector layers. Okay. I can show another uh, project which has like a much better looking buildings. So Here, as you can see, like I made the, uh, all the buildings green and made them a bit transparent, as you can see. It's a much bigger data set than the other one, and it works fine. Now there's something else I want to show. I will return back to the other project. I want to show like the sync in between the 2D and 3D navigation. So here we added uh, uh, an option to to move to make the 3D, 3D map camera follow the 2D map like this. If you move around in the 3D view, uh, in the 2D map, the, the 3D camera will move automatically to follow the same position that it sees from the 2D view. We can do the opposite as well, like, like here. The 3D map view, uh, the 2D map canvas will uh, navigation will follow what you are seeing on the 3D view. And we can have like both ways, like this. The three, the, if you move the 3D view camera, the 2D ca map canvas will navigate to what you are seeing. And if you do the opposite, the same thing will happen. Like the three D, um, the three D camera will follow what you are looking at in the two D map canvas. There is also the visualization 
of the of what you are seeing from the 3D view, like these this polygon here. It shows you what you are looking at in the 3D map on the 2D canvas. Oh, that's cool. That's very useful. I think that's about it. Like, I will let Martin tell me if I forgot something. <laughs> mm, cool. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, that was great. Uh, thanks for the demo. Um, awesome. So uh, maybe let me just quickly back, uh, get back to the COPC or COPC or COPIC uh, uh, data of uh, point clouds. Um, Howard did already a brief introduction of it, and Blog SMS showed how to how to deal with this data set. But I just want to say that I, I find this um, format uh, really exciting, just because yeah, it uh, allows like nice backwards compatibility, and you can simply uh, take a single file, put it somewhere on a remote server and uh, use it directly from QGIS or any other application. And what is, what is most important uh, is that, you know, the, the data set you can put there can be huge, you know, like a gigabyte or many gigabytes, gigabytes of data, but still QGIS is not going to download all of it, and, but it will really just pick the small bit of information it needs um to to download so it's a um, very efficient way how to um deal with uh, with the point cloud data so um uh, really um i'm really happy that um uh, how uh, howard and his team have managed to um um make it real and um also support the development of uh, tooling around it I actually forgot something uh, <laughs> from from the 2.26 version. QGIS will uh, automatically generate COPC datasets instead of EPT. Will like index it uh, with COPC. Uh, yeah, good point. So whenever whenever you load some point cloud dataset, uh, you will get it automatically converted to uh, the COPSI format uh, as well. Um, so uh, that can be handy elsewhere as well. Uh, before that, we used uh, some other format called uh, EPT, uh, but that one consisted of uh, lots of um, small files. And so it was generally a bit more complicated to, let's say, move it around um, and so on, because you could easily end up with many thousands of files to deal with. While with COPC, it's just uh, one single file, so it's much easier. Um, all right, we have a few more things to show. Uh, so let me try to share the screen. So um, one, one big part of um, what uh, we've been uh, working on has been the um, um, elevation uh, profile tool. So um, that has been uh, done by uh, Niall Dawson from um, North Road. Um, I'm not going to do like a complete uh, demo of it uh, because he has already managed to do really really nice demo of it um, and it's on his uh, YouTube channel. So if you search for QGIS elevation profile deep dive, um, I guess we can also put this um, uh, URL into the uh, notes. It's a really nice, very detailed um, uh, dive how to, how to use it. For those uh, who haven't seen it, I will just do a very quick uh, demo how how it looks like uh, with um, uh, point clouds. So if I load some uh, data set, uh, so let me do again our favorite uh, trenching castle. Uh, here we go. Um, so I can switch to the classification. So 
Here in the view menu, there is the elevation profile, a uh, new item. So when you click it, you get a new um, a dog widget and um, you can capture curve. So I will just uh, click it and pick um, two or more points uh, to define the um, uh, profile line. So let's do something like this to cross my cross the uh, castle tower. And ta -da, here we go. So we have the uh, profile. Um, you can see that as I'm going along uh, the profile, there is a black dot uh, showing where uh, you are on the map. Uh, there are lots of uh, features, um, things like you can do measurements, both um, uh, for the distance and for elevation. Uh, you can do uh, zoom in, zoom out. Um, here you can as well see that um, if I uh, if I zoom out a bit, oh, sorry, let me just do this again. Um, here I have the full profile, um, and the profile is uh, automatically updated as I zoom in or zoom out. So here is some basic detail when I move closer to the uh, castle. Uh, you can see that there are more points uh, showing up. Uh, this is useful because yeah, you can ha really have millions of points along your um, uh, curve. Mm, you can do export to PDF, to images. Um, you can also, just, I could maybe make it just one meter, uh, so I will get um, fewer points in the uh, profile, as you can see. Um, so let if I switch back to 10, um, I can open and close this uh, list of layers that are considered for um, elevations. If I need to do some adjustments um, by default, uh, as you could see, uh, the profile tool is respecting the styling of the layer, so it's using the same colors, but I could um, want, let's say, compare two different uh, point cloud layers, so in that case, I would uh, ignore this and just say one layer should be with one color and the other one with a different color, and um, that would be it. Also, what is nice, Nile has added this um, option to apply opacity um, as we go further away from the from the line. So you can probably see that some points are a bit more transparent. Um, it. Um, gives quite a nice effect especially um, with like trees and so on so um, there's really a lot to it i can also um, combine this with uh, any other um, layers so raster layers vector layers mesh layers all of that is supported i can load this uh, uh, digital elevation model sorry i just need to fix the uh, CRS here because it wasn't correctly um, defined originally. Yes, yeah, so you can see this is a usual uh, digital elevation model. Um, and if I create a new uh, profile, it will be, ah, sorry, now it uh, won't be included because I first need to say that the uh, raster layer actually represents some elevation surface. Um, but So there is this new tab about elevation for um, all layer types. Depending on, on the layer type, um, there will be different content here. For rasters, you can pick yeah, the scale offset. If, there, if it is multi-band layer, you can pitch with, um, pick which band it will be. This one is just a single band. So if I, let's say, pick a um, um, black color, uh, it should be uh, showing up. Uh, where is it? Um, maybe, yeah, I need to just redraw it. Uh, yeah, so now you can see the thick uh, black line, which is uh, coming from the raster digital elevation model. 
Vector layers are also nicely supported with a bunch of extra options. So I will just stop here and refer you to the um, full video from uh, from Nile. Um, among some other uh, features we have added is the support for um, on-the-fly triangulation of uh, point clouds. So um, what that means is that uh, normally if I um, have a point cloud in uh, 3D view, uh, let me do this. If I open the 3D view, um, um, it's still showing up here. Um, OK. So um, the usual point cloud, of course, if, as soon as I zoom in, the some what looks like a full uh, surface from the distance, uh, obviously, it uh, dilutes into lots of um, independent points. Um, and we had a request that it would be nice to actually be able to automatically connect the points into surfaces, uh, which is especially useful for um, like uh, the ground. So that's um, a new option that we have here for the 3D rendering uh, options. There is now a new group called uh, Render as a Surface uh, Triangulate. So um, uh, if I enable this uh, layer now, um, here I have set up that um, um, the filter is just for ground points, so that's the classification equals two, and uh, I'm using the um, uh, intensity. So this is um, the same data set, um, completely triangulated. So as I zoom in, um, you can't see individual points it's all um, full surface um, and here these are these are the places where are actual buildings where are no ground points so uh, there are these big uh, triangles you can even um, skip triangles that are for example longer than some distance so you will get uh, holes like this um, and so uh, this is the ground layer and this is the other layer which has the filtering every, everything that's not ground so when i enable it um, i get this uh, nice fused it's not sure why it's uh, blue now um, let me switch back to this yeah and so now i have this um, uh, combined view where I can zoom in and get uh, individual points of, let's say, buildings and um, uh, trees. Actually, not sure why my trees are uh, red. Uh, so it's maybe, okay. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are there are some uh, bugs. Uh, anyway, yeah. So that's the. Um, on the fly uh, triangulation. Um, cool. So um, I think uh, we are getting close to the end of the demo. Um, you know, we have 10 minutes left of the session. So it'd be great if we could have some question time. Um, actually, maybe ju just quickly mm -hmm. um, before the question time, if uh, we still have um, Howard around, um it would be also nice um to maybe quickly talk about the stack and uh, like how uh stack can be useful with uh, point clouds and uh, management of uh, uh big data sets uh yeah so we've been working with uh microsoft planetary computer to to develop uh a copic catalog of all of the usgs uh, lidar collection which is about 200 plus terabytes of content and provide a stack api for and, st and stack information for all of those tiles uh, so it represents like 43 trillion points or something like that so it's just this humongous data source and to be able to uh, figure out 
uh, where you are, select the data that you want. Uh, you need some kind of map to it. And so stack, spatio, temporal, assets, catalog is that map. And so there was uh, some work that was recently done by Cartoza to uh, develop a plugin for uh, accessing stack catalogs and, and filling your uh, QGIS view with uh, data and allow you to manipulate and, and figure out what you want to select from, from those stack catalogs. Uh, Martin was showing in a video that he tweeted recently uh, doing that for Copic uh, content on Planetary Computer. So um, Copic, uh, because it's a single file and because the data uh, management for point cloud data typically is tile-based, right? So divide and conquer is the hammer that you have. And, uh, you know, the, the management of uh, the point cloud content in tiles is, is just the common thing. And so that fits very well with Stack. And so there's a point cloud extension for Stack that shows how to uh, um, add kind of the special bits that you might want for, for LiDAR point clouds, for example. Um, but the, the generic uh, Stack items, catalogs, and collections um, also apply very well to, to point cloud content. So uh, here Martin's showing us how to, to go fetch some point clouds and um, re directly render them and fetch them over the internet. So um you know the as martin said the the especially for visualization uh you don't need all of the point cloud uh you don't need all of the points and uh you know these tools like copsy uh, ept as well and twine point tiles as well um are an important uh data management tool so that especially for doing rendering you don't have to have uh every point uh to be able to make effective visualization or even effective analysis in many ways. And so, you know, we're excited that uh, these tools are maturing to the point that they can uh, be made available in QGIS in the next release. And we're excited to see uh, what cool things that people are able to do with it. Um, you know, LiDAR point cloud content is uh, more and more available. Uh, you know, if you have an iPhone Pro 13 or 12, you have a LiDAR on, in your pocket. Um, you can use those with some free scanning applications to go make geospatial point clouds of your street or your house or your whatever. Um, and you'll be able to plop those things in, into QGIS and render them if you want. Uh, it might take a bit of work to, to make a really large area. You might want to uh, use an actual laser scanner to do uh, you know, your city or, or something at that scale. But for small scale point clouds, um, you know, th this is uh, becoming a reality. And so uh, it'll, it'll be neat to, to see how people are able to pick this up and, and go forward with it. Fantastic. All righty, brilliant stuff. Um, is that everything, Martin? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Awesome. Then I'd like to open it to whoever's in the room. Remember to unmute yourself. If you have any last questions for the last five minutes, please ask them now. From the vociferous consumers of all the cool stuff you guys make, what's, what's next on the roadmap? Mm, uh, that's a good question. So... Um, yeah, it uh, really depends on on all of the users. So, um, what is what is currently in the pipeline? Um, we would like to do um, export of uh, uh, point cloud data, so that um, you could easily just pick maybe like a small area of interest and extract it from from your bigger point cloud data set to um, a really small one or even to uh, save it as a whatever shape file or uh, DXF uh, or so. Um, so uh, that's, um, that's going to be implemented, I think, for the next release of QGIS. Um, apart from that, um, yeah, um, who knows? Um, if uh, everything goes fine, uh, we would probably uh, do another uh, round of crowdfunding. Um, we've started to do a bit of brainstorm and it seems that there is uh, still a lot of stuff that we would like to add, um, especially like this uh, kind of management of larger uh, amounts of data, um, like with uh, stack and, and so on. Um, yeah, uh, the processing of um, 
point clouds. That's also something that uh, is still missing and um, various other things. So there is a lot of scope. Um, let's see what uh, the future brings. Uh, there are still maybe two more smaller bits of work that uh, we need to finish from, from the current uh, crowdfunding as well. So uh, stay tuned. Awesome, I'm excited. Thank you so much for all the awesome stuff you guys have done, really, <laughs> from the users out here, we really appreciate it. Any last questions from the room? And I don't have any questions in the live chat, but there are a lot of likes for this video. So um, it just leaves me then to um, thank the team um, for bringing forth your awesome new features and for actually doing the work and getting um, the point clouds and being able to get this 3D visualization to a point where, you know, someone like me is excited to go and have a look and use it. Um, me being a cartographer who's not too like, you know, <laughs> into the 3D world, whereas now I look at it, I'm like, oh, it looks like a video game. Let's go look at it. So I think that's absolutely amazing. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us in um, the room. You're not always, you know, um, spoken about or brought up, but thank you so much to Ethan and the Marks and Alex and Victoria and Mufusa and jo Johan. Thank you everyone for coming and please join in to the next session, which is going to be on a plugin um, about trees and um, looking at different trees. So um, thank you everyone for being here and catch you for the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.